But uh, anyway, the topic of my talk is thanks for everybody for coming, first of all. Again, my name is Ted Johnson. I'm out of the, the Watomo office. I'm the water resource biologist for uh, the Winnebago system. I inherited that, luckily for me, about a year ago. No, I, I actually am I'm, I'm quite fortunate. I wanted to work with the system. I'm from De Pere. Um, I'm, uh, I have, my dad lived in Oshkosh for like 15 years, so I'm very familiar with the system. Um, anyway, um, my, the, the title of my talk is Lake Winnebago Aquatic Plant Management Strategies and Options. Um, the agenda, there we go. Let's talk about lake trophic status uh, quickly, uh, finding balance, especially with phosphorus, uh, physical role of aquatic plants. Uh, this is something that more recently I have information about. It, it kind of meshes with what Michelle was talking about. Uh, lake bed stabilization and phosphorus will be associated with that, with the physical role of aquatic plants. Um, aquatic plants and recreational use, which I think is why a lot of you are here today. Uh, aquatic plant management, uh, native versus exotic species, and how the DNR views them and how uh, you're uh, allowed to or, or permitted to deal with them from an aquatic plant management standpoint. Uh, control options, the advantages and the disadvantages for each option available to you. Um, future direction, including organizational development, a lake association or a lake district. And then grants, um, which is the, the department, the state does offer quite a bit of money for systems. Um, lake Winnebago, I feel, hasn't received its fair share by any stretch of the imagination. Um, this is a, a similar slide to what Michelle had shown. Um, so I'll also go to one of the uh, questions the gentleman had. Um, basically, Lake Winnebago has been fairly static. You, you, we sample the lake, I sample the lake at three locations, on the north end by Appleton, Mid Lake by Oshkosh, and the southern part of the lake near, down by Fond du Lac. You don't want to do this on a windy day when you're on the water. It's, it's quite rough. Um, basically, you're, you've been bordering on the hyper-eutrophic to eutrophic um, edge for all the data I've seen for the system. Um, that's based on transparency, how uh, far light penetrates in the water. We use a Secchi disk. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that. Uh, chlorophyll A, which is a, a measure of the amount of algae in the system, and total phosphorus, which of course is a limiting nutrient, which I'm, I know looking at the past talks that have been given here, you've been, uh, it's been discussed. Uh, basically, you've been um, right on the line between eutrophic and hyper-eutrophic. A lot of hyper-eutrophic systems, examples include Park Lake, number eight, Partyville, um, or Portage, uh, that lake lost all its plants. There's no plants in there. It's a series of algal blooms. Uh, lake Tainer and Minoman of Bio Claire, uh, Red Cedar Lake up there, um, other ones that have lost all their plants. Um, so there's a balancing act. Uh, when, That's a good question. I would think it would, you know, this is just personal opinion, but I would think it was in the mesotrophic range. But I think we're going to hold questions to the end. Is that what? Oh, I'm sorry. Where was Lake Winnebago a couple hundred years ago? Um, you have multiple river systems flushing through that system. Um, I, and, you know, with all the aquatic plant growth in there, with all, all the cultural or human-induced eutrophication, I would imagine it was probably in the mesotrophic range. I, it's, it's a shallow system. I can't imagine it was oligotrophic. Um, again, that's personal opinion or professional opinion. Uh, Blue-green algae, as Michelle mentioned, has toxins. Um, my first 30, 40 years of memory on Lake Winnebago was of the left side of the picture. <laughs> I remember pulling in walleyes and perch where I had to clean off the fish to see what I had. Um, and then on the right side, you have the abundant, overabundant aquatic plants. Now, we've all heard about the benefits and values of aquatic plants, and that's very, very true. But there's a balancing act. Um, you know, you don't want to, if you lose your plants or you have more available phosphorus, you'll have more algae. Now, if when you get so much algae, you're going to lose your plants because you have le uh, less light penetration. So, again, you know, when we start talking about managing aquatic plants, we have to be thinking how much. You know, we don't want to take too much and, and swing the pendulum back towards the algae side too far. So there's a balance. I just want to make that point quickly. Um, quickly, the physical role of aquatic plants, so Michelle mentioned they protect shorelines from erosion. They, they dissipate wave energy. That's quite true. They also um, hold lake bed sediments in place. Just think about your lawn. If, if someone came in and peeled your grass back and you got a heavy rain, 
you know, if you have any slope to it, or even if you don't, you're going to move soil off your lawn, right? Lake, lake plants, aquatic submergence, and, and emergent plants do the same thing. The root systems hold the lake bed sediment in place. And I'll show some examples of this in a second. Um, it le lessens um, resuspension of bed material. You know, as you, anybody who lives in Winnebago knows you have extensive fetch and a lot of wind and waves. As these waves go along, if you have a north wind, for example, as it goes, you go further south in the lake, you're going to get more and more turbidity as more and more lake bed is redistributed into the water column. And then, of course, your, your plants can't photosynthesize because they don't have any light reaching them. So it's a compounding thing. This is critical in shallow lakes like Winnebago. Winnebago does have 20 foot plus water, but the lion's share of it's shallow. Um, this also increases your phosphorus values. This is uh, Silver Lake, two pictures of Silver Lake. One is uh, in the southwest corner, that's the County Park estuary, and the other's in, on the eastern side of the lake, which would be uh, the Silver Creek estuary. And the eastern side, that system used to have no plants in it, and it would be chocolate milk like you see on the left side. Now there's plants in there. Th these pictures were taken on the same day. The plants in the system, even though Silver Creek is also this about 65, 70 percent of the phosphorus load coming in the lake, it's a much bigger watershed, that's clear water coming into Big Green Lake because of the presence of plants. Okay? Now you look on the left side, it's the County Park Marsh, that has no submergent plants and very few emergent plants in it. And you can see the color. That day was an east wind. You see the, along the, east, the, the um, west shore of Green Lake, you see the brown plume. It pushed it all to the side. If that had been more of a southwest wind, it sends a plume out into the lake. So again, this is a very important thing that plants hold lake bed sediment in place where you end up with that brown situation there. Both estuaries are about 200 acres, actually. Now here's another example. This is uh, Lake Puckaway, and Lake Puckaway, if you're familiar with it, is in Green Lake County and partially in Marquette County. You have the Fox River that comes in in the bottom left-hand side, and it discharges up in the upper right-hand side. Uh, west winds are predominant, and this last summer we went out and we sample on the west side or the left side. You can see where the river comes in, that darker color, that's clear water relatively. Uh, and then we also sample the mid part of the lake and also on the far um, eastern side of the lake. Phosphorus levels where the fox came in to the lake there were at 0 0.06 milligrams per liter, which is not too bad. But, excuse me? Excuse me? That's the same thing as parts per million. Okay. Then the middle of the lake, mid lake, was already up by point, the point 0.16 for phosphorus, and this is a surface water sample, integrated sample. And then on the east end, it was 0.23, which is four times the concentration, which is, that's 0.23 is off the charts hypertrophic. Resuspension of bed material. So you have the wolf coming in clear, or you know the fox coming into Butamore, the pool lakes. And it's a similar type situation. So plants provide a role that you may not necessarily think. This, this is more recent data. That's why I wanted to share it with you. Um, but you can tell what happens. And, and also, it's pretty telling to mention that the west end, Lake Puckaway, is where the most submergent aquatic plants are. From mid-lake to the eastern side, there's nothing for submergent aquatics in there. So anyway, I just wanted to make that point quickly. Um, other thing is, uh, I heard, I know you've been um, heard about the public trust doctrine, and the department tries to weigh all uses of water resources and balance those, which can be difficult at times. So you want to balance public rights. You have varying user perspectives. Some people, if they're water skiing, most people probably don't like aquatic plants out there when you're water skiing. Swimming, most swimmers probably don't like aquatic plants. But if you're scuba diving, which I scuba dive or snorkel, aquatic plants is where all the life is or located. So I actually will swim on the, the weed beds more often than not because I see a lot more interesting things. Fishing, uh, you think there's one that would probably most likely like plants. Well, guys that like to troll out in the middle, including myself, you get a lot of weeds on your lures. That, that When you, you used to not have that issue, that's a problem for you, correct? Um, hunting, you know, what's their perspective? on aquatic plants. Most likely they like them. 
photography people are watching the same thing. So you have to balance all those things. Um, then also uh, native versus exotic plant control. Um, you know, Michelle did a good job of explaining Eurasian water milfoil and curly leaf pine weed. Well, the department's position on that is active control. You know, we support it. Um, the goal being eradication, which is unrealistic, but we try to, um, typically in the small lakes especially, we try to get the levels down to what we call a maintenance mode where you have like less than five acres, less than 10 acres, and you try to keep it there. You may have started off at 20, 30 plus acres, but you get it down to a small population, the natives come back, you try to keep it there. On a system like Winnebago, it's going to be a major, major challenge because how large the system is and the wind and wave energy. Uh, the common thing I hear from biologists that work with the system a lot longer than I have is that one year you'll have your Asian water milfoil thick in a particular area in the lake, and the next year it's all gone. You know, so that creates a unique set of issues from a management standpoint, from a planning standpoint. Um, typically for um, exotic plants like milfoil and curly leaf pine weed, uh, spring chemical treatments is what the department has found through research to be the most effective. Um, if for a curly leaf pine weed, you want to be really early, well before 60 degrees Fahrenheit, the water reaches that temperature. Your Asian water milfoil, a little bit later, but still before 60 degrees or 62 degrees. Um, we also support harvesting to an extent. Um, there has been some uh, research and utility found for harvesting, especially uh, curly leaf pine weed before they form those turians that Michelle mentioned. Um, now for native plants, it'd be more of, a, I think, a spot treatment. Uh, how effective would chemical treatment be on a system like Winnebago for exotic plants? Um, I think it's a tool in the toolbox. I think it has some utility. I think it's going to be more of a spot treatment. You're not going to be able to say we have a thousand acres of Eurasian water milfoil on Winnebago and we want to try to get that down to 100 or 50. That's unrealistic. I think it's going to be based more on human use and areas of high human use where we'll try to keep it out of those areas as much as possible. Because the propagules, like, like Michelle had mentioned, those turians, they, they can stay in lake bed sediment for five to ten years, we're finding. And if you let it go too long, now you have a tremendous seed bank that even if you chemically treat it for five, it would take you five to ten years just to get rid of the seed bank, not to mention anything else that comes in with wind and wave energy. Yes. I'll be discussing that in more detail. When we get through then, if there's any more specific questions, we can address it at that time. Um, DNR, for native plants, you get there. There we go. Uh, DNR supports control if plants are at nuisance levels and navigation is impaired. Uh, it's funny, some people, um, you go out and you look and, oh my goodness, you, you can't even see their dock, it's so covered. There's definitely um, some impairment for navigation there. I've had other people tell me that, you know, they're treading water and every once in a while a plant tickles their feet while they're treading water, and that's a major problem, they want to kill them all. Well, there's, there's degrees. Um, so control efforts must involve, for the DNR to support treatment of native plants, um, or at least from my perspective, there's no loss of species. Some of these chemicals actually show that, that we're supposed to impact some native plants have been shown that, yes, they can impact native plants. And that's research is ongoing, but we keep finding out new, um, more and more plants are susceptible that weren't supposed to be, so you have to be very careful about that. Um, so lot, losing a native species from a lake is a big deal. It's like taking red pine out of your forest. You know, what's, what's the impact of that? Or red oaks out of your forest, what's the impact of that? It's hard to measure. Um, you want to be uh, minimize potential spread of exotic species. That's very important as well. Um, and the area impacted must be just large enough to meet the intended goals, whether that's navigation, you know, swimming, fishing. Uh, you don't, you don't want to, again, how much is too much? I think you've got to always ask yourself that question. Um, the DNR uh, Aquatic Plant Management and uh, Protection Program, protection is an aspect of this. 
Um, typically, the three main methods that the DNR supports, there's some other ones that are out there, as I would call it, would be manual removal, which is physical removal. I'll get into that in more detail. Chemical control, which is governed by administrative code, or um, NR107. You need an NR107 permit to do chemical control. Um, mechanical harvesting, which is NR109, is administrative code. Um, now, for manual removal, um, a water plant or a riparian landowner may cut, rake, hand pull out aquatic plants for a 30-foot area without a permit. That's a width. I'll show you a picture in a second um, illustrating that. Typically around your docks and piers. Um, there's cases where we've allowed more if, it's, if one dock is serving multiple riparians and you have multiple boats. And we try to be reasonable. Um, you cannot use, without a permit, external auxiliary power. You can't go down there with the rototiller when the water's low. You can't go out there you know, with your chainsaw or whatever you want to use. <laughs> you just can't do it. Uh, it must be a handheld device, like a weed whacker. You know, I've you know, seen people use that, shears. Um, they actually sell specialized equipment that does this. Um, and the vegetation must be removed from the water body. Um, this is a, a little bit of a fuzzy slide, but it gets my point across, is 30 feet is width, and you can go out pretty much as far as you need to. Okay, Some lakes, you, know, you might have a foot of water depth going out for 60 feet, and you have cattails going that whole distance. It's reasonable to go out to that, that 60 foot terminus. Um, that's a repairing use zone. Um, advantages of manual removal, it's cost effective, it's environmentally safe after June 15th, um, northern pike, perch, spawn, and emergent vegetation. So if you're out there ripping it out, you may actually be you know, harming fish populations. Uh, allows for selective removal, as Michelle mentioned, there's some beautiful plants out there. Uh, I personally, if I had pure weed in front of my place, and Eurasian water milk oil, I like to move, remove the milk oil and leave the pickle weed. Um, provides immediate relief, uh, whereas other things like chemicals can take some time. Um, plant biomass is removed from the water body. Uh, nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus are within that plant tissue. You take it out of the system, you are taking some nutrients out of the lake, albeit a very small amount, but that is a, a definite advantage. Um, disadvantage is uh, labor intensive and can be extremely labor intensive <laughs> depending on the circumstances. Um, like probably like going after zebra mussel shells on on the shore. Uh, impractical for large areas or dense beds. Uh, it's destructive. It stirs up lake bed uh, substrate as well. It may disturb benthic organisms, bottom organisms, in fish spawning areas, bluegills and the and the like. And then you, you, there is a risk of whenever anytime you're moving. Um, especially native plants, there's a risk of in, introducing invasives because you've created a niche. The invasive species are pioneers. They like disturbance. They, they, they're the first ones to get there, the first ones to the party, so to speak. Uh, now, we don't need to go over all these in depth, but this, there's a list of, and there's, it's much more lengthy than this, of, of what we're supposed to consider when we're um, issuing a permit for uh, chemical control of aquatic plants. Um, you know, the first, the chemical has to be registered for use in the state of Wisconsin. Um, it can't be a hazard to humans, animals, or non-target plant species. It can't injure uh, fish uh, eggs, fish larvae, or organisms for fish, which is good, of course. Chemical not used in locations known to um, be habitat or for known endangered or threatened species. Uh, will not be used in an official sensitive area. That, a sensitive area that's official was actually designated by the DNR. Um, chemical applicators licensed to apply the herbicides in water. That's a, a special license for applying herbicides in water. Uh, basically, for chemical treatments, the cost for the permit is there's a $20 processing fee, $25 per acre after that. It caps out at 50 acres, so the maximum fee, even if you want to treat the entire Lake Winnebago system, would be 1270 just for permitting. Now, applicator and chemical costs are another matter, $400 to $1,000 per acre. And that's probably, you know, could go up. Um, but there are state grants that cover a large portion of this. So that's something else that we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, chemical. Uh, Treatment also, there's two types of herbicides. There's contact herbicide, 
which which kills the any part of the plant it, it comes in contact with. But it's not systemic, which is the next one, which actually go down and, and get the root system. It's like using Roundup in your yard, you know, where you, it kills the whole plant as they advertise for dandelions and, and the like. Contact kills what it comes in contact with. Systemic gets into the, the, the um, vascular tissues of the plant and gets and moves down through the whole system and gets the root system, causing more complete mortality. Um, chemical treatment advantages of this type of uh, aquatic plant management is selectivity to an extent, um, if done correctly. If you treat early in the year, and the reason to do that is a lot of the native plants haven't even emerged yet. Mercurial leaf pine weed is active, for example, or Eurasian water milkwell. You want to treat while those plants are dormant. So you're targeting specifically, you know, the exotic species. That's very important. If the water temperatures get too warm, like this year was, is a really bizarre year with the hot weather we had. The water temps jumped up and the emergence started come, the natives started coming up faster than normal. Um, another advantage is it can be applied to restrictive areas like docks and boat lifts, where if you were using a harvester, you'd never be able to get into these narrow little spaces. And it's effective for spot treatments where you, if you were in a particular bay and you have a patch of milfoil over here, but there's natives all around it, you wanted to get that one spot, that can be effective. Um, disadvantages, it's extremely expensive. Uh, many people are strongly anti-chemical, and trust me, they call me. Um, some herbicides are non-selective. Uh, there's new research that shows, as I mentioned earlier, that um, we never thought certain chemicals would ever impact natives, and we found that they have, actually. Um, there's lake use restrictions for some of these chemicals, if like you can't swim for a week. Uh, some are slow acting and, and, or may take multiple treatments to get the desired effect. And I, in my personal opinion, I think a lot of my colleagues feel this way as well, is it's poor for navigation channels. If you wanted a 50-foot navigation channel for boating, for example, and you went out and chemically treated it, first you've created a, one heck of a niche for exotic species. I'll go into this in a little bit uh, more detail in a minute. But, but as Michelle had mentioned, with coontail and Elodea, two native plants, they're really not rooted. And they come floating in, and literally you could treat a, a chemical a, a channel with chemicals, and wind shifts direction, and you'll have a mat of coontail and, and um, LED and even your age water milk oil from elsewhere in the lake would completely plug that channel up and now you're out of business from a navigation standpoint. Um, then here's a picture of a harvester in operation. Uh, you can see that uh, basically it has, uh, I like to walk over there, I only got two streets. Um, there's a cutting bar up here. There's a, a more or less a, 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 an elevator type transport system here that goes up into a hopper in the back. And it's usually operated with a paddle wheel so you can get, it's a conveyor system that's carrying it up. There's a paddle wheel so you can get into shallow water. Um, but there's a limit to, sometimes the cutting bar can go down to from four feet to six feet depending on what type of harvester you're, you're looking at. Um, but there are limits to water depth that these can operate in. And two or three feet, it's getting too shallow for them. Uh, then here's uh, a harvester on offloading the plant material, and you can see that there's another conveyor system that's bringing it up, and there, if there's not a trailer there, but there's typically a trailer that's there to, to catch it, and farmers will bend over backwards to receive this material because it's excellent, excellent fertilizer. Um, so there's definitely a use for it. Um, some criteria used by, by the DNR to evaluate permit applications Will harvesting remedy the water use impairment? Uh, will endangered and threatened species be impacted? Uh, will let negative long-term consequences occur to the native plant community? Um, will call will cause water quality impacts? One serious concern is disrupting lake bed. Harvesters can uh, can do that quite well, actually. Um, and there's a lake depth issue with that. There's some large systems that use harvesting. This is Buffalo Lake. It's about 2,100 acres in Marquette County, right by Montello. Uh, you can see the harvesting quite clearly. It's a herringbone design. They have three, no, four harvesters, and usually three of them are running just about every day. They spend about $75,000 per year on harvesting operations. Um, they, with that said, the entire lake is littoral. The Fox River flows through it. 
and there's so much flow in there, and, the, and it's almost all Eurasian water milfoil and curly leaf pondweed to boot. Uh, it's too expensive for them to treat a system this large, and so that's their only option. But typically, three to four harvesters are running every day. Um, and so when you're applying for a, a 109 permit, um, accurate mapping is a must. This actually looks exactly like their permit application where they drew in the lake. And exactly what they actually use GPS to, to mark the locations of where they're going to harvest. Um, maximum channel widths are typically 60 feet or less. Um, we do allow for the main channel sometimes to go a little bit um, wider. Uh, you, you can see um, back here. They have three main channels: one that runs along the north shore, one that goes down the middle that they actually ski on, and another one that goes down the south shoreline. So they have three main channels, and then all these are laterals that are coming in. Okay, the cost for a permit, for a harvesting permit through Chapter 109, or NR109 rather, is $30 per acre. It caps out at 10 acres. So if you want to harvest 50, 60, 100 acres, it's only going to cost you $300. That's the max fee for permitting. However, on the equipment side, one of those harvesters cost $45,000 to $100,000, and I've even seen higher than $100,000 before. Um, their shore conveyors are about $20,000, and trailers cost from seventy dollars to $20,000. There are grants available to help this, though, offset this cost. Uh, the advantages, immediate results. Uh, plants and associated nutrients are, again, removed from the lake, so you're exporting phosphorus out of the system. It's selective. If you know you have a particular part of the lake that has real sensitive habitat, important habitat for any number of reasons, you can avoid those areas. Uh, channels, again, Michelle had mentioned this too, uh, fishery studies have shown that these channels cut through the weeds actually um, help remove some of the panfish out of the system. You can get rid of that stunted bluegill panfish phenomenon that we see so often. Um, also see fatter and happier northern pike and bass. Um, Regular harvesting maintains good navigation. Uh, like I said before, if you're going through there more frequently, even if plants like uh, coontail or LDF float into the area, you're able to go remove them so people can still get around on a daily basis. So that's definitely a positive. Disadvantages, initial and, and maintenance costs are very high. Um, when these break down, it can be quite expensive. Um, Repeated harvesting is required. Again, you know, with Buffalo Lake, they're going out there every day. Um, uh, it's like mowing the grass. It's a good analogy. Uh, small fish and insects and frogs can be killed. I've personally been on these harvesters where bass and I've seen turtles and everything else come up the conveyor. And so you're, you're diligently trying to flip them back in the water, but you can't get them all. Um, uh, they're hard to, or well, you may spread exotic species, as Michelle mentioned. Uh, Eurasian water milfoil naturally fragments on its own, but it's a real uh, fragile stem, and these things will shred them up. And if you don't pick up every piece with the harvester, which you're supposed to do by permit, but is impractical, uh, you're spreading it around potentially. Um, but you're mowing the grass, so the native plants, you're not completely removing them. You're just cutting the top off. So unlike chemicals, you didn't open up the entire lake bed bottom. You're just shaving off the top. Um, they're hard to maneuver around docks and cannot, cannot harvest in shallow water without disrupting lake bed, which by permit you cannot do. Um, chemical versus mechanical. Uh, this is my personal perspective on it. Uh, some of my colleagues I know agree with me. I can't speak for all of them. Chemicals are best for aquatic invasive species control, in my opinion. Uh, mechanical is best for navigation issues. You know, we've been over this a couple times. Um, you've heard most of my reasons. Again, you can maintain it, and it, it, it's functional. Um, chemicals, I think, though, can be used in conjunction uh, with mechanical if for navigation-type situations. Um, a good example is Little Green Lake. They have a tremendous amount of shallow water near shore, and they have harvesters, but they can't get into the docks. So what they end up doing is, because of their lake district, they'll apply once per year, and anybody that's interested can have a, a chemical treatment in and around their dock. Their lake is borderline hypereutrophic, very similar to Winnebago in that sense, maybe even a little more towards the hypereutrophic side. 
And uh, so they'll send in as one in one bunch, like 50, 60 different permit applications for the tree around docks. So that's a an effective way to for us to handle a lot of permits as well. Um, that leads me to my next my next slide: organizational development. Uh, last year, I obtained working with Fond du Lac County a small scale planning grant, to, and I think that uh, I'm not sure if Paul's here today or not. Um, but they're working on organizing, developing either a district or an association, you know, for different portions of the lake, whether it be South Shore. In this particular case, it would be for the South Shore and the Fond du Lac area. Um, so I, I think that's going well from what I've been told. Um, it's important that you organize from a permitting standpoint because the department can't handle getting a thousand permit applications in at a time. It just it's just too much. Uh, so. It's also effective for lake planning and, and management. Um, it, it's, a, it's a forum to allow people to voice their opinions and, and discuss issues because everybody's got a different opinion or a lot of people have different opinions about a given issue. And everybody needs to have a voice to feel like they have ownership in whatever the end product is, whatever it's decided for from a planning standpoint for goals, for example. Um, it's also a forum to voice diverse opinions um, and build consensus, consensus, as I mentioned, um, also to communicate with us, with the department. If you have a group and you work together to form, formulate uh, you know, sort of a united voice, we want to do this. It's stronger than having you know, a thousand people calling in with different opinions, I think. Um, it also allows, if you, you're able to form an association, differences and conflicts to be resolved internally and to form, to get everybody on the same page, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, again, I had mentioned before minimizing the number of permit applications. Um, you have a blanket permit for a whole area. Um, and eligibility for state grants. The county can sponsor it. Um, as an association, that wouldn't give you the ability, like a district where you're a governing body, to sponsor your own grants. Um, then, I, my goal here wasn't to really discuss like management planning, but yeah, any kind of lake management plan is going to need to be dynamic because of we talked about the ever-changing landscape of Lake Winnebago. And so goals, um, it, they need to be tangible and realistic. Uh, basically that you, know, you can measure them and that you, you're putting something forward that within a, a shorter period of time, long or short range or long range goals, you can see and, and have a definitive answer of whether or not you achieve that goal. An example would be to reduce your age water milk well in a particular bay, bay by 50% the first year, 20% the next year, that would be a goal. Um, purchase a harvester could be a potential goal. Um, obtain an NR109 permit. Uh, so, um, and also once you have those goals and objectives together, then you monitor for success, success or failure and set up new goals and update that often. So for now to get into lake grants, oops, okay, there's uh, basically there's different types of grant grants. There's uh, planning grants, small scale, large scale, lake protection grants, and aquatic invasive species grants. Um, also, you have to be a, a you need a qualified sponsor, like counties, cities, villages, um, Indian tribes, lake districts. There's detailed information about this on that link there. Um, also, you can search lake grants in the DNR homepage. That works quite well. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the individual grants quickly. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, small scale lake planning grants, um, education, uh, Final Act, the city of Final Act received one of these last year. Um, to obtain and distribute information, develop management goals. In this case, they're trying to organize and, and start to get ready to form a lake association. The state uh, share that is 67% of a project up to $3,000. There's two cycles you can apply for, February and August. The same is true for large-scale grants, where it's $25,000 cap on that, again, 67% cost share. Your actual cost can go down if there's match. If you, you're providing uh, boats or time, labor, and things, that'll go down. Um, ultimately, I think it'd be a great idea to go for a large-scale planning grant to try to develop a lake management plan so that you could have a game plan in mind for dealing with overabundant aquatic plants. Uh, 2010, I, I saw it 
Crystal Lake, and especially on my final act in 2010. And then but what happened in 11, though, wasn't nearly as bad as 10. So you, that's where you have to have that dynamic plan in place for contingencies. There's a protection grant um, that's usually more so for protecting a lake, um, for water quality, um, implement recommendations of the lake management plan. If you have specific goals you want to accomplish that will help the lake, and you identify those in your lake management plan, you can go for a protection grant that will cover that, and that's up to $200,000, depending on what type. And 75% of the cost is the state for that. It's competitive. These grants are all competitive. You compete against every other lake in the state that applies for these grants. Um, and then I, I argue for you, and I do my best. <laughs> so May 1st deadline on that. Um, there's a lot of interest in Lake Winnebago, though, and Lake Winnebago has grants coming, in my opinion. Um, AIS control, uh, the purpose is to prevent and control the spread of aquatic invasive plant species. Um, maximum amount um, for the education, prevention, and planning is $150,000 for established population control, which you guys have. It's $200,000 to 75% cost share. Spring and fall grant cycles of February 1st and August 1st. Then there's a recreational boating facility grant. That's one that would help you get at harvesting equipment. And that pays up to 50% of the cost. Uh, there's no application deadline. Eligibility, you must have a lake management plan or an approved harvesting plan. Um, and uh, the link for that is given. Uh, I think that would be a good idea to pursue that potentially. And then contacts for the grant program for large and small scale lake planning and protection grants, that would be me. That's my phone number uh, up there. Also, I have cards in the front of the room. Um, and then for AIS grants, that's Danielle Block. And her contact information is up there as well. Um, I guess at, that, at this point, I'd like to take questions. Um, I can leave that up there. I have another slide. It just, it's kind of a nice, pretty one like Michelle had. But uh, uh, I want people to be able to copy the numbers and information down. But yes, sir. Uh, the question is using aquatic invasive species like Eurasian water mill for acrylic pond weed to either uh, use them in a compost type situation and sell them commercially or use them as an energy source. Uh, both great ideas in my opinion. Um, using them for an energy source, I really, that's not my area of expertise. I'd be interested to look into that. Um, so far as composting it and, and potentially selling it, uh, I haven't really heard of that one either, but I see that that could possibly have some utility. You'd have to make, once you're composted, there wouldn't be any threat to be a spread you know, throughout the state. I know farmers will fight over getting the plants. So that, that's a, possi a possibility. I have to look into that, but that could offset some of these costs. If you had a, enough land and stuff to set aside and actually develop something like that. That's a good idea. Yes? Okay. Excellent. Yes. Oh, the the state money part of it that we're allocated so much money per year, um, and it changes. It's somewhat dynamic, and that's it. You know, so that there's not enough money to go around typically for these grants. So it's based on there's a, a ranking that goes on that we actually, the size of the lake, the amount of recreational use, there's a, a lot of factors that go into it. So every time an application comes in, it gets a score associated with it, and it competes against lakes even in Vilas County, Racine County, all, all over the whole state, and only a portion of those receive the monies. 
so we have a, a ceiling of amount. I, you know, Rob, I don't know if you know the, the top of your head. It's, it could be a million, a million five per year. It's not a huge, huge amount. And um, some years it's been decreased as well. A million five seems sounds about right for control. Yes, sir. The question, yeah, the question is concerning Green Lake, Green Lake County. Uh, where is their operating capital coming from? Because they do have a harvesting program, and they're they're not doing ongoing management. Uh, they're developing a lake management plan right now that I'm involved with, but they have a sanitary district. Uh, they don't really, uh, they don't have a lake district per se. They have a sanitary district, and that's where a lot of the money comes from. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't know about the legality of selling it. Um, I don't think there's a problem with that. Um, but yeah, that would be a good idea for them to look into. But they have a lake district, okay. and they not a sanitary district, and it's a taxing body. And so they collect revenue from each person that you know is within their district boundaries. So uh, that's the difference between an association and a district. An association is voluntary. You know, if you don't want to contribute this year, you don't have to. A district, you're going to be taxed. So that's something to consider when you're you know trying to form an association or a district. The people here have. Are you supportive of forming an association of trying to organize? Okay. Any other questions? Well, thanks again. I appreciate you coming.